All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you very much for joining me both here in the Ragged Theatre and also online. It is a real honour today to be able to present this distinguished Geoscience Australia lecture, and I am pleased to be doing so on behalf of the dedicated team of groundwater scientists that I have the privilege of working with here in Geoscience Australia. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Christina Anastasi, and I am the branch head at Geoscience Australia's Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division, and I look after the Advice, Investment Attraction and Analysis team. Um, this today is a, an exciting opportunity for me to ignite your interest and, and excitement about hydrogeology. And I look forward to improving everyone's understanding of the value and importance of groundwater to Australia. Um, now, to help do this, we're going to explore the vision and delve into the origin story behind the National Hydrogeological Inventory that was the first truly continent-scale update to Australia's hydrogeological mapping and supporting knowledge base in over 35 years. Now, before I start, I need before I kick off officially, I would like to do an acknowledgement of country and the ver these, I'd like to acknowledge the very first hydrogeologists and groundwater enthusiasts of our continent, the traditional owners and custodians of country right across Australia. I'd also like to recognise their continuing connection to lands and waters, which importantly includes groundwater, as well as connections to communities and culture. And I'd like to pay my respects to the people, especially elders, past and present. I'd also like to pay my respects to any traditional and First Nations people that might be joining us today. Um, I'd like to now um, introduce you to uh, our speaker, and today we're going to hear from Steve Lewis. Now, Steve trained as a geologist at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology and the University of Tasmania before embarking on a career in the diamond exploration sector. What an exciting sector. I like diamonds personally. <laughs> During this heady introduction to the minerals industry, he worked extensively across the tropical savannah country of Northern Australia and later spent time hunting for kimberlites in the windswept deserts of the Sahara. What a life you've had, Steve. What a beginning. Heading back to the academic world, Steve later completed his PhD research on hydrothermal, and I probably said that wrong, and my apologies to all the groundwater scientists and hydrogeologists here, um, altered seafloor basalts and dolerites in the exposed oceanic crust of sub-Antarctic Macquarie Island, where he learned to dodge rampaging elephant seals and curious king penguins, oh, I imagine that, in pursuit of the perfect outcrop. Now, since arriving at Geoscience Australia over 18 years ago, uh, Steve has focused on hydrogeological research and groundwater investigation. These studies have included mapping and analysing ancient Paleo Valley aquifers across the arid zone of Western Australia, South Australia and the Northern Territory and assessing potential cumulative impacts to groundwater systems from coal mines and coal seam gas developments in Eastern Australia. Now, most recently, as part of the Exploring for the Future program, Steve led the successful delivery of the regional assessments and national inventories for groundwater component of the National Groundwater Systems Project. Now, I'd like you all to please join me, even online, clap, um, in welcoming Steve to the podium. And I'll pass over to Steve. Thank you. It's great. Thank you very much, Christina, for that very warm introduction. And uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome along. Look, it's great to be here. I'm really honoured to be um, yeah, the recipient of a Distinguished Geoscience Australia lecture and um, yeah, really looking forward to sharing with everyone both uh, in the audience here today in person but also to the audience online um, a little bit about the work that we do in the groundwater and hydrogeological space here at Geoscience Australia. 
So thank you, Christina, for the introduction again and for um, the, uh, the welcome uh, acknowledgement of country. Really appreciate that. Um, I guess I'd like to start by going back to 1896 when famed Australian bush poet Banjo Patterson penned an ode to the importance of groundwater in supporting Australia's expanding pastoral industry. And if you'll perhaps indulge me here for a minute or two, I'd like to kickstart our proceedings today by reciting a couple of verses of Banjo's famous Song of the Artesian Water. And uh, it goes a little something like this. As the drill is plugging downwards at a thousand feet of level, if the Lord won't send us water, oh, we'll get it from the devil. Yes, we'll get it from the devil deeper down. But it's hark, the whistle's blowing with a wild exultant blast, and the boys are madly cheering for they've struck the flow at last. And it's rushing up the tubing from 4,000 feet below till it spouts above the casing in a million gallon flow. And it's down, deeper down. Oh, it comes from deeper down. It is flowing, ever flowing, in a free, unstinted measure from the silent, hidden places where the old earth hides its treasure, where the old earth hides its treasures deeper down. Thank you for that indulgence. Um, now look, I, what I think this does, this is a, a popular literary work of the day. It really provides us now with an insight into the importance of groundwater for the economic development and prosperity of the fledgling nation of Australia in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, in particular, the recognition of the massive and often free-flowing groundwater resources of the Great Artesian Basin which was first drilled incidentally in New South Wales in 1879. I think it's just really captured the spirit and the imagination of the people. And ready access to what was seemingly unending water supplies suitable for livestock provided what was the key ingredient at the time to unlock a vast expanse of otherwise inhospitable country for pastoralism and other various agricultural pursuits. But of course, the value and the importance of groundwater in Australia uh, was long understood before Banjo's time by the original inhabitants of our continent. And so the ability of Aboriginal people to adapt and survive across the many different landscapes and climate regimes was due really in large part to their ability to recognise, understand and access suitable water resources. Now in arid and semi-arid areas in particular, finding and accessing groundwater and using it responsibly and sustainably, it really played a critical role in supporting many First Nations peoples. Um, so they've actually developed enduring strategies of traditional knowledge, oral histories, uh, stylized mapping, and this was refined over the course of millennia to really ensure that this knowledge of vital groundwater resources was passed on as part of their culture. And we can see here on screen an excellent example of a, if you like, a conventionalised map which was actually drawn on a spear thrower. And it shows the links between what were known wells and rock holes in part of the great sandy desert country of the Bindaboo people in WA. So a really strong example of how that, uh, that sort of played out as a cultural feature. Now, for people who are really interested in learning more about Aboriginal people and groundwater, uh, I've put a link up here to a really excellent paper by Brad Mogridge on the subject, and um, I'd um, you know, encourage people who are interested in knowing a little bit more about that to jump on and have a look um, at some of the details in there. So I guess against this backdrop then of the historical reliance that we've had on groundwater, let's fast forward now to modern Australia, where Groundwater use has greatly expanded around the country and is now really critical to maintaining our way of life in many places. Um, reliable access to safe and sustainable groundwater really remains vitally important for Australia, um, certainly now and into the future. Um, so some examples of how groundwater basically directly supports our way of life. We start off with looking at the many towns and communities right around the country particularly in those areas where surface water resources are scarce and unreliable. Um, but it's worthwhile realising that groundwater resources are not only important for, if you like, outback areas of Australia. And a good example of this is the Perth region in WA, where about 70% of all water used in that region comes directly from groundwater sources. Now, of course, groundwater also uh, supports a wide variety of uh, industrial use and, and economic developments right around the country 
Uh, this includes things like irrigated and dry land agriculture, uh, directly supports a number of mining and resource developments and various manufacturing and related commercial enterprises. So very important from that economic point of view. But of course, it's not just that point of view. Um, groundwater is also incredibly important for sustaining what is really a vast array that we have here of natural, terrestrial, aquatic and subterranean ecosystems and their associated environmental assets. So very important from that side of things. And groundwater also feeds a number of socially and culturally important places right around the country. And a really good example of this uh, are the mound springs in desert areas of central Australia. So you can see that bottom image there, which are really significant cultural sites for many local First Nations peoples in that area. <clears throat> now, I would say that, in fact, you can really um, think about Australia's reliance on groundwater as being truly remarkable. Um, it is really the only reliable and cost-effective water source for around two-thirds of our entire country. So we can see here on the map on screen that anyone living or working in those uh, orange and pink areas of the map really depend mostly on groundwater for their water requirements. So overall, groundwater provides up to one-third of Australia's total water consumption, and that depends on um, any given year the amount of annual rainfall that occurs and the abundance of surface water that we have. But conservative estimates of annual groundwater uh, extraction around the country typically run to around 5,000 or 6,000 gigalitres of groundwater extracted a year, which actually equates to 10 or even 12 times the total volume of water in Sydney Harbour. So I had to get a mention of a Sydney Harbour water unit uh, in as part of this talk. Now, in terms of its actual use, we find that around 70% of the groundwater that's extracted in Australia directly supports agricultural production, and that's particularly irrigated agriculture, which is worth billions of dollars, as we know, to our economy. Um, an interesting point here, back in 2013, uh, Deloitte actually provided us with a, a ballpark estimate of what they saw as the true value of total groundwater use, um, both direct and indirect in Australia. And it's a, a staggering $34 billion worth um, to our economic activity every year. And this was over a decade ago, so you know, it is potentially even more than that now. So those numbers are truly remarkable, I think. So I think it's, it's clear from this um, overview then that groundwater has and continues to be a very important natural resource for Australia. Um, however, the, the reality is that understanding groundwater systems and processes is quite challenging and complex. In particular, its subsurface nature means that it's largely hidden away from our view. So we can't readily see groundwater like we can see it flowing in rivers or creeks or uh, occurring in lakes. So this does make it more difficult for us to map, monitor and model our groundwater systems. And it can often lead to various misconceptions and myths arising about groundwater. And I guess at a, a basic level, we can see some of these misconceptions illustrated in uh, some diagrams of the Earth's water cycle, where there is often limited attention or even misrepresentation of groundwater uh, on these sorts of diagrams. Now, unfortunately, such misunderstandings like this have led to situations in the past where groundwater resources have been undervalued, and this then has negative flow-on effects in terms of long-term sustainability and management of the resource. So I guess really what I'm getting at here is the upshot is that to adequately support suitable um, and sustainable groundwater management, policy development and governance right across Australia, it's really vital for us to focus efforts, and this is at a variety of scales, to improve scientific and technical understanding and use that knowledge to help address what are our major groundwater challenges uh, in Australia. So I hear you say, what are some of these challenges that we face, um, I guess, both now and into the future? Well, we're talking about you know, a number of issues, but I've put a few here on the screen just to give you a flavour. So these are things like improving the effective and efficient allocation and use of our groundwater resources. And this might include in situations where there might be different users competing for access to that same resource. Uh, another one is managing potential impacts on groundwater dependent ecosystems, which I showed you some nice images there of before, as well as uh, where we have connected surface water and groundwater systems. Another uh, quite obvious one, I guess, is to understand potential impacts of climate change and how that might affect our groundwater systems. And examples of this might be effects on the, uh, the timing and volume of groundwater recharge to particular aquifers. 
Uh, we also have to be mindful about areas where groundwater quality can be at risk. So this might occur, for example, in coastal areas where seawater intrusion can increase um, groundwater salinity. Uh, other management challenges, I guess, are thinking about you know, new and innovative ways of managing groundwater and alternative methods such as managed aquifer recharge, which uh, for those who don't know is sometimes called underground water banking. So this list here, you know, it's not exhaustive, but it highlights a few of the areas where we do see some of the um, current and I guess emerging challenges that are ahead of us to um, improve sustainable management of groundwater. Now, the need to, I guess, continue then this focus on hydrogeological research and to improve access to relevant data and information was highlighted by the Australian Government's 2016 to 2026 National Groundwater Strategic Framework document, which is a, a good read for those who haven't uh, come across it before. Um, I guess more recently as well, this was also given some greater emphasis through the publication of a research priorities paper, um, which you can see put the front cover on screen here. This came out of the National Centre for Groundwater Research and Training, uh, which is also known as the NCGRT. Uh, importantly, this document, what it does, it summarises what they identified from consulting with a range of experts um, were 18 different research priorities across eight major themes in the country, and really identified these as areas that we need further investment to build that capacity for sustainable groundwater management. So among the research priorities, there is some explicit recognition of the need to improve our knowledge of groundwater systems and develop the methods and materials that will assist the community to better understand groundwater systems, risks, and the uncertainties that are inherent in uh, studying groundwater. And so I've put on screen here, uh, I guess, a, qu a key quote from the document, which emphasizes really the need to secure uh, environmentally sustainable groundwater supplies we need this proactive investment in groundwater science and its adoption in future water management solutions. So some really timely um, research priorities coming through there at a national scale. Now, thinking then about Geoscience Australia's role within this national groundwater research context, and I guess we play quite a, a, an important role here to provide access to data, information and advice that will help empower decision making um, by a range of uh, our stakeholders in government, communities and industries. Uh, importantly, we do strive to work collaboratively with a range of partners so that we can leverage our uh, complementary skill sets to deliver what is a better understanding holistically of Australia's groundwater. Uh, and so some good examples of this, um, recent strong strategic collaborations that were built with organisations such as the Bureau of Meteorology, uh, and the CSIRO, and so there's been some really productive work coming out of those um, collaborations in the past. And realistically, there are further opportunities for us to continue exploring into the future with other like-minded organisations such as ANSTO, uh, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, and, and other key stakeholders across government. Um, also important to note that building relationships with our state and territory groundwater colleagues is really critical because the role that the jurisdictions have uh, as the responsible managers of groundwater, which includes things like allocating the resources, uh, determining extraction limits and monitoring for potential impacts. So really critical that we partner with our uh, jurisdictional colleagues as well. Um, <clears throat> now, the groundwater work that we do here at Geoscience Australia is guided to large part by our strategy 2028 framework here, outlining, of course, our seven major impact areas, uh, and one of which, as we've highlighted here, is to help secure Australia's water resources. So as well as this strong internal strategic driver, um, our groundwater program also aligns with recently updated Australian government science and research priorities and supports a number of other um, cross-governmental water-related programs. These are things like the National Water Initiative, and the National Groundwater Strategic Framework, which I mentioned there before. But if we want to look, I guess, in a little bit more detail, particularly at securing Australia's water resources, we can see on screen here our four key strategic objectives um, as part of this impact area. Now, we've been really fortunate here at Geoscience Australia over the last four years to have been able to advance these strategic drivers through our Exploring for the Future program. And really this program, um, which I incidentally finished up at June um, early this year, for those who may not be aware, it's really been a critical enabler for our groundwater teams to focus on those regional and national scale hydrogeological challenges 
consistent with those strategic commitments that we have. And I guess um, at the forefront of our recent work has been efforts to develop uh, an updated online platform to improve access to information about Australia's hydrogeology and groundwater systems. And so this particular work, it's really closely linked to the third and the fourth dot points that we can see on the screen there around delivering this complete map of Australia's groundwater systems and conducting detailed regional assessments. Uh, importantly, these objectives are also quite consistent with those key national research priorities, such as those I uh, mentioned before in the NCGIT paper. So what is this new online platform then? We've called it the National Hydrogeological Inventory, or the NHI for short. And in the next part of my presentation now, what I'd like to do is explain a little bit more about why we've developed it, um, what information it contains, and some of our plans to enhance its future potential. But let's start this little bit of the journey then by looking back at what was the first continent scale depiction of Australia's groundwater systems. And this is the fantastic hydrogeology of Australia map, um, which you can see on screen here. So this was actually first published in 1987. It was a hard copy, A0 format, with a set of explanatory notes to go with it. Um, and I think it was really groundbreaking work at the time, led by the Bureau of Mineral Resources, which is one of Geoscience Australia's predecessor organisations. Now, the main feature that we can see on the map here, so those main areas of uh, blue and green, various other shades, are the principal aquifers of Australia, which were defined as those aquifers that produce the best quality groundwater at the highest yields, but from the shallowest depths. So let's just have a quick look there. I'll get my laser pointer working on screen. So we can see here in the, the darker blue and the darker green colours, the location of what are Australia's major groundwater bearing basins. Now, covering most of inland Queensland and extending here to neighbouring parts of the Northern Territory, South Australia and down into New South Wales, is the Great Artesian Basin, which is arguably Australia's most famous groundwater resource, potentially one of the most famous in the world, some would say. Um, on this map, we can also see other notable groundwater systems as well. Up here in WA, we have the Canning Basin, uh, along the coast, the Carnarvon and Perth Basins. Um, up here in northern Australia, in the darker green, we have the so-called Cambrian Limestone Aquifer, which occurs across three different geological basins, the Georgina, Daly and Wiseau Basins, as a really important water resource in that part of the world. <coughs> if we look a little bit further south, uh, we can see the Murray Geological Basin here, as well as some of the modern groundwater alluvial systems that uh, are associated with the modern Murray, Murrumbidgee and Lachlan Rivers, which feed into the Murray uh, Basin here. And then further south, we have the uh, Otway Basin and Gippsland Basin, to name a few. So that's not all of them, but it gives you a, a bit of an idea, I think, of some of those major groundwater systems in Australia. Now, as part of the initial efforts of our work in the Exploring for the Future program, we undertook to critically review this map and the set of notes. And out of that work identified what we saw as several notable limitations, which really affect its current uh, application and I guess ongoing usefulness. So you know, an obvious one is probably the fact that the map and notes have not really been revised or updated since they were first published in 1987. And that's despite the many subsequent studies that have been um, done in Australia, contributing a wealth of new data and information on Australia's hydrogeology uh, hydro and groundwater systems. Um, another thing that we noted was that <clears throat> while certainly some of the information from this original hard copy map has since been digitised and made available, um, the online version it really lacks a lot of supporting information and we can see an example of that here where we look at this 1987 hydrogeology data set as it currently appears in the Geoscience Australia data discovery and delivery portable, uh, portal. So with the, the shape and the extent of those principal aquifer polygons, we can see that they're largely consistent with what we saw on the hard copy map. Um, but if we note here in the uh, inspection tool on the side here, which you bring up by clicking on one of the, the aquifers, there's very little in the way of supporting information to tell you much about um, any of these aquifers on the map. So essentially, the best you might get is a very short description from that original map legend, which at a, you know, a word or two at most tells you something on the type, the distribution and productivity of the principal aquifer that you're interested in. Now, given this was the situation um, from our review, we could see then a real need to improve the type and coverage of national hydrogeological information available across the country and also have it packaged up in this ready um, 
delivery and access via the portal. So having access to such a, a modern online platform means that we can plan for future upgrades to content and functionality so that we don't have to wait another 35 years until there's a, a revision again. So having access to that is a, a really important part of our strategic um, objective here. So I guess that's a little bit about the background, if you like, uh, as to why we invested in creating the NHI. So for the next part of my talk, what I'd like to do is look at uh, a little bit about what we've done to develop the in inventory so far with a focus on, I guess, what are those spatial building blocks that we're reporting against, uh, the type of data and information compiled for each of the regions that we're interested in, and a, a brief introduction to the current version of the inventory as it occurs on the portal, noting that we are now in version two after our first release. And for anyone who's interested, there's a, a link to where you'll find it's uh, on the portal, but don't worry, that link will come up a number of times throughout my talk as well. Uh, as well as a QR code, so thanks Hash for that. So, moving on, what are, if you like, the fundamental building blocks of the imagery are 42 hydrogeological provinces across the country, which you can see all shown here on this map. And I guess now you might be able to understand that somewhat obscure reference to 42 aquifers in the uh, presentation title of my talk. So these provide us with a complete spatial coverage of Australia and derive from the Australian Geological Provinces data set. Now, what we see on screen here are a combination of the major sedimentary basins that provide groundwater resources around the country. And these are shown in the yellow, the blue, the red and the green colours, denoting different geological ages, as well as those intervening fractured rock or, if you like, non-basin regions. Uh, and they're in the light brown colour here. Now, you'll note that because we're dealing with sedimentary basins of quite a varying geological age, um, as we can see on the map here, the full extent of some of those older basins is actually obscured by the overlying ones in places. So, for example, the older green colours with the Proterozoic and Paleozoic rocks are obscured in places by those overlying basins. Now, of course, um, important to um, recognise as well that there are um, also geologically younger aquifers that might form, for example, in modern alluvial sediments or in volcanic rocks, and these can overlie um, any of the, the provinces that occur as well. Now, we haven't neglected these in terms of what we report on the, on the inventory, but we include them as part of that underlying province in which they occur, so that we can discuss them uh, and not neglect them, but still have that spatial coverage across the country here. In terms of what uh, data and information we capture then for each of the 42 provinces, <clears throat> we're really talking about um, 11 major themes with a total of approximately 100 different data and information attributes. So I've shown the different themes um, by name on this pie chart around the, uh, in the screen here and the proportion of total attributes out of those 100 or so. Now, as you'd um, imagine, there's a really strong focus on uh, geological information, hydrogeological and related groundwater system information. But importantly, I think we've actually supplemented this with a range of contextual data as well, which covers everything from understanding uh, information about the jurisdiction and administration requirements uh, of those areas to information on demographics, uh, geography, climate, environment and even surface water data. So we've really tried to provide a good rounded picture of what's going on in each of those regions. So we report uh, a combination of geospatial data which we source from existing national scale data sets. And, and this is an, an important point to emphasise because we decided at the outset, uh, because we wanted to focus at this national scale, to use data that was available to us to provide that complete and consistent coverage rather than attempting to, uh, to integrate information that might be a little bit more piecemeal from regional or jurisdictional studies. Now, you'll see how we, we address this as well a bit later on in my talk, but for the moment at this national picture, we're talking national data sets such as the uh, geological provinces, which I've mentioned before, things like the National Groundwater Information System or the uh, NGIS as it's known, uh, the Atlas of Groundwater Dependent Ecosystems is another good one um, to, to mention here. Uh, sorry, just trying to fix that up there. Uh, as well as various other environmental, uh, geographic and climate related data. Now, importantly also, it's not just data and statistics that we're reporting uh, within each of these, these regions as well. So we've made a conscious decision to, if you like, provide some greater depth and enhance the value of the inventory 
by um, providing a number of tailored summaries of written information, which is based on our analysis of relevant scientific and technical literature that's out there. So this, what this does is really help us to develop a, a strong supporting narrative, um, fo focused certainly on the hydrogeology and the groundwater systems for each of the provinces. And we think it, it makes the inventory reports a much more well-rounded synopsis of uh, what we know about each, each of the areas of interest. Now, to give you a little bit of an idea then about what this looks like, um, I've just included on screen here two of the main themes, so the hydrogeology and groundwater themes, to um, show you, take you through, I guess, dot by dot there, some of the information that we're reporting on. So for the hydrogeology theme, there's a, a nice um, overview summary, if you like, of um, what we know about the hydrogeology of the particular region. We then focus on things like the groundwater flow systems, uh, some information on the hydrochemical composition of uh, groundwater in the aquifers. If there's any information available to us on hydraulic connectivity between the, the basin, for example, and an overlying or underlying one. Um, we obviously talk about the names and the types of the major aquifers that are there, uh, the nature of any of those overlying ones, as I mentioned before. We also identify units in the national aquifer framework. In the, uh, the related groundwater theme for each report, there's information on, um, I guess, more from information uh, in uh, groundwater bores. So we look at the number and density of those, give a breakdown on the purpose and the status of the information in the bores, talk about the drilling um, dates, and provide some basic information on water levels and salinity. So, of course, this is only two of those 11 major themes that I mentioned, but um, it gives you a, an idea of the sorts of content we're trying to capture. Um, but certainly for those interested, uh, there's a lot more out there, so please jump in and have a look uh, when you get the chance. So that's a little bit about the content and the areas, but I guess you know, researching, compiling all this together, synthesising it and reporting it, what is really a treasure trove, if you like, of, of hydrogeological information? It's really only part of the story that we're, we're um, touching on today. So. We've also invested in developing this modern and effective means to deliver the imagery via the uh, Geoscience Australia portal. This has really been quite an important part of our delivery strategy for uh, the NHI. Now, as I mentioned before, the current version that's on the portal is version two, released in March this year, and that's had some minor content and presentation updates from the original release in October last year. So let's have a little bit uh, of a look then at how this uh, appears on screen. So this is the initial starting point when you load it up through the portal, showing you the, the 42 provinces. And here we have them coloured based on the, the type, extent and productivity of the main aquifers, as we can see in the legend there. Now, from this display then, you can obviously move and uh, zoom around the map, navigating to different regions that you might be interested in and uh, seeing some of the, the finer detail, I guess, uh, that might be specific to your area of interest. Uh, from there, you can also select that province simply by clicking on it uh, and then launching alongside there the portal's inspection tool, which gives you on screen, if you like, a, a subset of the complete imagery report that's been developed. So as an example here, I've uh, selected the Canning Basin up there, clicked on that, and we've got the subset of information that's coming through um, on screen. So you can get that uh, initial feel for the sorts of um, information you're looking for in this region. Now, at this point, importantly as well, you can also link directly here from this online summary at the top of the page there, and that'll take you directly to the full province report, which is developed in PDF format, uh, available through the GA data and products catalogue. And so that full report is the one that contains all of the, uh, the data and the information that we've compiled across those 100 different attributes and the 11 major themes that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> so I think as you can see from what we've gone through here, what we've developed so far with imagery provides us with that national snapshot for all pro 42 provinces that we're interested in, uh, looking in particular at things like geology, hydrogeology, groundwater systems, and the related geospatial and contextual information. Now, we think that making this content freely available and easy to access um, should benefit a range of uh, potential users who are interested or need access to that high level information on Australia's groundwater systems. So some of the particular key values and benefits then that we see with the NHI, obviously um, yeah, it provides us with that consistent foundational layer of uh, information to help inform better decision making, uh, again, by government, community and industry. 
What we've done is, if you like, modernise the way that the uh, information is delivered and provide that timely update to content first published all the way back in 1987. Uh, the imagery we think will also help to facilitate broader groundwater systems understanding across jurisdictional boundaries. Um, this has the potential to improve research collaborations, science approaches and information sharing. And importantly, it also extends to complementing the, the work of the Bureau of Meteorology who and uh, supporting their national groundwater information system, which they administer under the Water Act. The imagery can also help to prioritise those areas um, which might be data poor or have some significant knowledge gaps. So prioritise those areas for further research and investment into the future. And I guess finally here, the, the flexible design allows us to enact those further updates or modifications in future with a minimum of fuss um, and avoid the situation of uh, you know, not being able to update anything for another 35 years. Now, the good news that we've seen so far is that we're already aware of some examples of uptake of the imagery by a number of other organisations. And for example, the National Water Grid Authority, um, they publicised their interest in the NHI um, late last year or just after it had come out, recognising that um, yeah, they're able to explore this as a new tool, um, if you like, an additional resource to help them guide some water infrastructure investment decision making. So that's a really good, uh, good starting point and a good story to hear. But I guess the work we've done so far, while we recognise you know, it's a, a foundational starting point at the national scale, our vision for the NHI is much broader than what we've been able to deliver so far. Um, you know, for example, a key limitation that we're aware of is that you know, the initial release doesn't give you the opportunity to provide an option to drill down at finer resolution or for us to have undertaken any new data analysis or interpretation across the, the 42 provinces. Um, however, and I guess this is a, a key point in the, uh, whoops, sorry, what we're, we're talking about here. Um, we were mindful of this limitation at the outset, and I guess to help address it within the scope uh, of exploring for the future, we initiated what was like a complementary activity of more detailed, um, sorry, more detailed assessments. There we go, um, and we've done this to start with in several priority regions around the country. And so I'll show these here on screen now. The first of them was the Caditanda Lake Air Basin in Central Australia, which you can see there in white. And just to the north of that, the South Nicholson Georgina Basins in Northern Australia. So what I'd like to do now over the next few slides is provide some examples to help illustrate the scope of the research that we've done in these two regions. And keeping you back, um, back of your mind that ultimately we're planning to roll out this style of assessment across all of the 42 provinces uh, in the imagery so that we can really add that next level of detail and clarity that we're after. So here we can see on screen uh, maps of our two regions. So these are very large, obviously cross jurisdictional areas with regional scale groundwater flow systems. And, We've prioritised these two regions to start with based on some uh, initial analysis that we undertook from information that we'd compiled uh, in the preliminary stages of the NHI and coupled that with our collective knowledge and I guess understanding of Australian hydrogeology. So the Caditanda Lake Air Basin covers around 1.2 million square kilometres across four jurisdictions, uh, South Nicholson, Georgina in the, the north of the country across the NT in Queensland is around 400,000 square kilometres. So in both of these areas, um, an early phase of the work that we did was to identify what were those key groundwater geoscience data and knowledge gaps, as well as the various research questions that we could then address as part of our investigations into these areas. And our approach um, to these more in-depth assessments really leverages what are core Geoscience Australia's strengths in multidisciplinary uh, integrated groundwater geoscience. So in these regions, we apply our skills and our expertise to a whole range of diverse um, topics such as you know, regional geological framework studies, uh, geophysical data compilation and analysis, remote sensing interpretation, uh, analysis of chronostratigraphy, um, aquifer characterisation and assessment, um, hydrogeochemical assessments of groundwater systems. And they're to name a few, but they give you a sense of the style of work that we look to employ in these more detailed assessments. And what this does is really provide us with that level of detail and the opportunity for more targeted uh, interpretation, which was simply not possible for us to do at that first stage national scale picture of the NHI. 
Um, I guess a really important component of these more detailed studies is to develop that solid understanding of the, the key geological characteristics of the regions spanning stratigraphy, architecture, geological history, so things of that nature. And what this does, it really puts the geology into the hydrogeology aspect and provides that strong foundation which underpins a lot of our later groundwater work. So the image we can see on screen here just gives you an example of that type of more detailed geological analysis here in the Lake Eyre Basin. Uh, with this cross-section showing some of the variations in sediment type and thickness through part of what is the Cooper Creek Paleo Valley in southwest Queensland. And so this is based on analysis of, uh, of existing borehole data, but it's this type of detail that then lets us map out uh, aquifer zones, for example, in the, the sandier sediments in the yellow. We can see where they might be uh, linked up or separated by more clay-rich sediments. Um, and that helps us to better understand things like potential for groundwater flow paths and connectivity through that particular aquifer system. Um, so a strong focus then, or having that strong focus on the geological framework improves um, our ability then to model various groundwater system components. And here we can see some uh, examples of that. That includes things like thickness and extent of what are major regional aquifers and also aquitides. And if we then integrate that type of information with data that we might obtain, for example, from groundwater bores, we can build up things like, on the left there, this map of saturated thickness distribution of Cenozoic sediments in the, the Lake Eyre Basin, showing uh, the, the areas where the main aquifers uh, are quite thick and saturated. And I guess we're also able to then develop or use that information to help us develop basin-wide groundwater mapping. And, and here we can see a new regional water table trend map for the Lake Eyre Basin as well. Really important to help us understand, obviously, the variations to depth to groundwater. Uh, where groundwater flow systems uh, occur, um, areas for groundwater recharge and discharge features. So really fundamental things that we can get out of the studies that we do in those areas. Um, I thought it was also important to highlight the value that we see in analysing and interpreting other national scale geoscience data and, uh, for hydrogeological applications. And here we're looking at the airborne electromagnetics, which many in the audience will be familiar with for the AusAM data set. But um, we've used it as part of both of these two studies that I've talked about to really delve a little bit more and provide us with some insights into hydrogeological systems that previously hadn't been done. So there was a lot of um, yeah, really good opportunity to do that. The example on screen that we can see here is from the, the Lawn Hill Springs region in that South Nicholson Georgina study area. So a couple of um, images at the bottom showing the connectivity prof um, sorry, conductivity profiles there where we can map out some of the, the variations in the different sorts of aquifers we know are there, look at some of the structuring and use that to help us explain why there might be springs forming uh, in the places that uh, we know they occur. Of course, we can also use things like remote sensing analysis from our Digital Earth Australia uh, colleagues as well and bring that in to help better understand things like um, groundwater ecosystem, vegetation type and the dependency that they have on, on access to groundwater. I guess the overall aim then of these more integrated geoscience assessments is to help us develop this improved understanding of groundwater systems and processes at the scale of the regions that we're looking at. And bringing all this information together um, helps us to develop new understanding through production of things like these conceptual model diagrams, new maps of flow systems, uh, recharge areas, things that didn't exist before, but by bringing all of that information together um, in applying our, uh, our skills and capabilities to understand the groundwater systems enable us to address some of those questions that we identify at the outset. Um, it also lets us recognise where there might still be gaps in terms of data that we don't have access to and so we can then recommend, I guess, for future studies um, areas for new data collection and analysis. So at this stage, the results of these assessments, they've been published as standalone technical reports uh, and they have accompanying data sets on the data and products catalogue. And you can see the relevant uh, details of each listed here. But I guess the, the main thing to take away is that ultimately we're working towards making um, the results of these studies also available via the NHI platform as well to provide us with that uh, extra tier of more detailed content, which will really complement and support the national scale information that we currently have. Um, of course, developing the NHI is not the only component of our work that we do to improve national understanding of Australian hydrogeology. Uh, some of us in the audience might have seen last month at the um, Exploring for the Future Showcase event, my colleague Dr Nadez Rolay discussed some related efforts to develop a continental scale three-dimensional hydrogeological framework. 
Uh, so using chronostratigraphic analysis, um, this 3D mapping work is really improving our basin scale understanding of extent and thickness of key units such as regional aquifers and aquitards. Um, this work has so far been successfully applied to the Great Artesian Basin as well as a number of other Eastern Australian basins. Uh, it's now being extended to other areas of the Centralian Super Basin, so into those northern, central and across into western areas as well. Um, now there's still more work to be done here, but it gives you a sense of the, um, you know, the style of work that we're also complementing the NHI with. And you can see a couple of cross sections there just to um, show, I guess, a sense of the scale and the sort of content that this work is, uh, is delivering for us in this project. Um, so I think this is another really excellent example, if you like, of um, the benefits of integrating multiple geoscience data sets together to arrive at that uh, you know, enhanced understanding. Of, uh, of Australian hydrogeology. Now, for anyone who's interested in learning a little bit more um, or seeing the Deja's talk from uh, the showcase, uh, there's also some information there about how we're working with the Bureau of Meteorology to update the National Aquifer Framework. Put a, a little link in there to that one with the QR code too. And just a, a quick plug as well, um, I'm not able to mention it in detail today, but the Exploring for the Future Showcase also had a number of other really fantastic talks by some of my groundwater colleagues, um, looking at some of the detailed, um, if you like, field investigations that we've done for other projects. So this is in areas like the, uh, the Upper Darling floodplain in New South Wales, uh, mapping paleo valleys in Central Australia and Musgrave province. So there's also a talk there in more detail on that South Nicholson Georgina Basin region. Um, really good place to go and have a look if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the sorts of work that we do here at uh, Geoscience Australia in the groundwater space. So we're sort of getting to the end now and just, well, as I hope has become clear um, through my talk, the vision that we have then for the NHI is for it really to be that central repository of knowledge about Australia's hydrogeology and groundwater systems, complete with complementary tiers of information available at multiple scales. So that'll let you drill into a, an area of interest and get more detailed information. Um, we've been lucky, I think, through the Exploring for the Future program to be able to develop that initial starting point that we have for the imagery, which is focused at that national scale and the 42 major provinces to provide us with what is a consistent framework and access to a range of useful thematic information. I think really the key then to realising what will be the next piece of the NHI vision will be to continue this style of detailed assessment in other priority regions, um, as well as enhancing some of the capability that we've got in the initial online platform. And I think if we do this, that will enable us to access that information at different um, resolutions. Now to help us realise this vision and I guess unlock that full potential of the NHI, we're currently looking to develop some plans as part of the recently announced Resourcing Australia's Prosperity Initiative. So I just thought I'd put in a little plug for that because there may be people who are unaware that earlier this year, the Australian government announced what is really a generational investment in national geoscience with the creation of Resourcing Australia's Prosperity Initiative, uh, a 35 year and $3.4 billion government commitment to be led by Geoscience Australia. So this initiative has a number of, I think, very ambitious um, objectives that cover everything from accelerating discovery of critical minerals, uh, supporting Australia's net zero transition and enabling responsible resource management. But from a hydrogeological perspective, I think we see a clear opportunity here with the initiative to continue to develop the scope and the functionality of the National Hydrogeological Inventory. And I think ultimately this work will help us to fulfil what is a key objective of the, uh, of the initiative to comprehensively map Australia's groundwater systems. So that brings us pretty much to my last slide, but before I go, I'd just like to reflect on a few um, key messages, I guess, to leave you with. Um, and look, while I'm realistic enough to recognise that you know, my talk today not, may not have moved everyone to write or recite groundwater-inspired bush poetry, um, I've hopefully convinced you of the benefits of, map, of mapping and reporting lock, stock and full smoking barrel on Australia's hydrogeological inventory. Uh, so briefly to some key points, we can see that groundwater has a long history of use and is vitally important to Australia. It supports our people, our communities, industries, our economic developments. Um, it underpins many of our ecosystems and ecological and cultural assets. So vitally important from that point of view. Um, 
Now, I've mentioned that despite its importance, understanding and managing groundwater is complex and challenging for us. And to improve sustainable groundwater management and address many of those challenges that we know we face, it will require additional proactive investment in groundwater science and communication. So great to see things like Resourcing Australia's Prosperity um, being aware of that. We've been lucky through Exploring for the Future to have been able to deliver this first truly national scale update to Australia's hydrogeological mapping and knowledge base in over 35 years through this first phase of the NHI work. Uh, and importantly, this directly supports both internally our Strategy 2028 objectives and broader Australian research priorities and national initiatives such as the Groundwater Strategic Framework. Uh, and the final point, sorry, uh, just to mention, <clears throat> We do have this longer term vision then for what the imagery um, is capable of doing. Um, yeah, we can, I think, greatly enhance its scope um, and enable integration of those more detailed content that we can get from those integrated um, resource assessments. Look, I'm looking forward to, I guess, being involved in that in the future because I think it'll be a core part of the work that we do um, as part of resourcing Australia's prosperity. Um, we've made a good start as a Still a long way to go, um, but I think the future is bright for us to continue that. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank everyone, both uh, in person and online, for being an attentive and hopefully appreciative audience. Uh, it looks like we've got a little bit of time for questions and comments now, um, so we can get to those. But look, if, if we don't get to everything, please feel free to reach out to me on that email there, um, and I'd be happy to discuss other ideas that people might have for enhancing the NHI into the future. Thanks again and bye for now.